Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Van City Health. Uh, today we have Andrew Pauls, who completed his Bachelor's of Science with honors in biomedical physiology while playing varsity football at the NCAA level at Simon Fraser University. He also received his emergency medical responder from the Justice Institute of BC, and he's been working as a paramedic for a little over a year now in BC, and recently found out that he'll be studying in UBC's med program this coming fall. So congratulations to Andrew, and welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks, Craig. Yeah, it. yeah. Uh, so to fill our audience in, and Andrew and I go back to high school, uh, where we got to know each other, uh, captaining the football team together at Vancouver College. Uh, and while we both went to SFU, we kind of went in different paths. So Andrew continued playing football uh, at a high level, studying science, while I ended up playing intramural soccer and taking liberal arts courses, um, but occasionally seeing each other at the cafe. Uh, but we're here today, and honestly, such um, it's so amazing to see you again. And yeah. thank you for, for, for coming on here. So uh, what, what when did you decide? that you wanted to become a doctor. Has Chiefs O-lineman Laurent Duvernay-Tardif, who was the first active NFL player to concurrently practice as a doctor, mm -hmm. been a role model in any way? Good question. So two-part answer. When did I want to start? I think uh, probably in high school, like grade 11, grade 12. I felt like I always had an affinity for like science classes, uh, really enjoyed math, all that type of stuff. And then I felt like, well, what can I do with that? you know, in the real world. And I just felt like, whoa, I have some, I felt like I had some decent people skills. And I felt that um, combining some of that scientific knowledge with as well, you know, helping uh, folks, you know, you know, the typical med answer is helping people out. But honestly, right. doing that type of thing that I felt like medicine was kind of the career path for me. Um, and yeah, so basically in grade 11, I, I kind of mapped out almost a plan of how I wanted to do this because I knew it was such an arduous process to, to get in and things like that. So that was kind of honestly grade 11, grade 12. And I've had some family in healthcare. So that was also a bit of an influence for me. Um, with your second question with, uh, oh, I don't want to butcher his name, Laurent. Duvernay Tardif. Yes. So I actually read a little bit about him. Actually, no, before that funny story. So when I was in grade 12, um, I got recruited by a couple of schools in Canada. So one of those schools was actually McGill, which yeah. uh, Laurent went to. And so I, I was telling the coach, we were, I think, yeah, this was in Vancouver. We're at a restaurant and uh, the coach, I, I told the coach, like my aspirations was to do medicine um, after I finished my degree. And he was like, oh yeah, we have this guy on our team, uh, really big old lineman. He's super smart. And uh, this is what he does. And, and, uh, and so basically he told him, told me his schedule and he's like, yeah, and I don't know if this is true, but this is what I remember. He literally said he studies for, you know, throughout the night, he'll go to sleep for two hours then he'll wake up, study for another two hours, go to sleep for two hours, wake up. study. For no hours. way. And that's literally, and I sat there, I'm like, is that what it takes to get it? And I was actually kind of freaking out because I was like, man, this guy sounds like a machine. Um, so I, I feel like that he didn't explicitly say who it was, but I feel yeah. like that was the person hmm. um, who was talking about. So maybe that's when I first got introduced to him. Um, and then I think the other thing that he said is he always like he he wouldn't go to like practices. He would just like study. And again, I don't know if this is true or not, but hmm. then he just played games. He was so good. And then when I actually read about him, I think that was actually my second or third year at SFU. And I was just like super amazed of how someone could do that because I yeah. was. I felt like I was like putting in a lot of time studying and, and, and playing sport and uh, just to, you know, see how someone could do that as well while being medical school yeah. and, and doing it at the same time. I thought it was incredible. So, yeah. I don't, so I don't know if he's like a, not a huge influence, but I think it's, it, it's something that's really interesting. For sure. Um, and, and I think it just really shows dedication. And if you kind of set that game plan up, you can accomplish some some pretty crazy things. Yeah. Um, so so going back to so you know in, in grade eleven that you wanted yeah. to go down this route, and so yeah. you kind of mapped out you know your entire life around getting to med school. Yeah, that's not. Yeah. Wow, that's pretty early. Um, yeah, I honestly, like <clears throat> maybe, and I, I'm trying to think of one of my actual big inspirations. This is another interesting story. Um, is 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 my great grandmother, which is. Sounds funny. I, I've never met her, but she was actually born in uh, southern Ukraine during, you know, pretty tumultuous time yeah. during um, the early 1900s. Anyways, long story short, she was actually one of the main care providers for a bunch of different villages um, during kind of that communist revolution period where there was a lot of anarchy, a lot of things like rough things going around. And I feel like that was like a weird, not a weird, but like an inspiration for me of, uh, of why I wanted to pursue that. But yeah, like definitely it's, it, ever since high school, I think 
that was a goal because I just knew it was such a big task and I kind of needed to be dialed in if I want to do football and pursue that goal. Right. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, to kind of going back to the education part, I know at SFU, the grading scale has been um, criticized for being a little difficult. Did, oh, yeah, a little bit. Um, did you know that going into SFU and that it might make, you know, getting into med school a little bit more difficult mm -hmm. um, just when they're reviewing their grades and, and that conversion um, of our GPA to their percentage scale? No, I did not. Okay. <laughs> um, I think I realized that probably in my like second year at SFU. Right. And I basically realized that I feel like it was like a 3% drop. So like if you got an A plus at SFU, that'd be a 95%. So yep. That's great. 95% is amazing. Right. But like what if I got 98 in that course? Right. Get the lower limit of the, of the GPA. Mm -hmm. Similarly, an A was an 87% conversion and an A minus was an 82% conversion. However, yeah. at SFU, we have some courses and A minus gets an 85 to 90 in some courses. Yeah. And an A is a 90 to 95 and an A plus is 95 to 100. Exactly. So you're basically at times losing 3%. Yeah, of your, of your grades. Um, and so, yeah, I was a little frustrated, especially when I looked, I also looked at some of the statistics and I saw that about 30 SFU students get into medicine every year, whereas I think like, um, I don't know, like 100 or, or something, like a, like a, a larger amount. And obviously, though, there's probably a lot more UBC students yeah. applying to SFU, so I don't know all the details about that. Right. But, um, yeah, definitely that 3% thing. I, I have no idea about. Yeah, no, I think when I was considering any master's program, mm -hmm. I look at my grades, I'm like, yeah, at least in on the communication side, yeah. an eighty nine would be sorry, an eighty nine percent would be converted to a three point six seven, um, mm. which is a rather tough drop, and then a ninety would make me an automatic four point yeah. So that was just tough to take in every time you got like eighty eight or eighty nine. Yeah. Whereas if you got an eighty eight or eighty nine at, at UBC, I believe that's like a four two. Yeah, around there because no, I I think yeah. four point three three is a ninety or above, which is. Correct. Nice to have yeah. <laughs> if you're studying at UBC. Yes, <laughs> but you know, push through, and uh, I'm I'm happy for it. Though. Yeah, and, and even while playing football, you happen to become a three-time GNAC all academic student athlete. Yeah. So, uh, can can you walk us through what a typical week like during season was like uh, playing football for SFU and how you balance that with a biomedical physiology degree? Yeah, um, it was pretty crazy. It's it's insane though how I've met. I feel like I've, I've met way smarter as like. To, to me student athletes at sfu like um the amount of, i don't know i'm just going on a tangent here but the amount of dedication and, and some other people that that are there just it's pretty incredible yeah. but our typical schedule um i can give you my fourth year schedule sure um so we had practices from seven to nine a.m every single day i commuted so i was actually about a 30 minute drive yeah up to sfu um however that 7 a.m doesn't include taping getting your gear on all that stuff so that's like probably another 20 minutes yeah. of preparing because you're running out there at 7 a.m like at times in like four degree weather or five degree weather yeah and you're like kind of rolling yeah at that <laughs> so yeah seven to nine so but you probably had to get there earlier so then again you have to prepare to be like okay i need to go to bed at a certain time so I right so you're not asleep then you do your classes throughout the day um and then you'd have another you know, two hour meeting in the evenings, and that would be around 5.30 to 7.30. So you had four hours of schedule time, but it doesn't even include the, the preparation time, watching film, right. your game plan, you know, your transition time between classroom to, to like practice, all, all those different things. So I feel like that adds an extra hour. So you're roughly yeah. like five hours per day, five and a half hours per day. I don't know. That's what I would think. Um, pretty much every single weekday, we get one day off. Uh, and then if you had an away game, you'd miss all your Friday classes. You'd play a right. game on Saturday, you know, get banged up. You get, yeah. hit, you know, you're basically like, and you're, war. and you, you're, you, you, um, you go down to the States. Yes. Yeah. 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 So you're, you, you're like, basically like if we went, we'd play some teams in like, uh, Northern California, we'd fly out there, but sometimes we'd like bus to like, you know, Western Oregon, yeah. be like an eight hour bus ride or a seven hour bus Crazy. ride. So then you'd bus down, play your game. And then bus back up and then you have like your day off basically would be sunday yeah uh it was, it was something that yeah and then you kind of started all over again um, insane so honestly i feel like it was like 30 to 40 hours a week in season yeah like almost a full-time job pretty much it was a full-time job and then your off season was a little easier but it's still like 20 to 30 hours a week um so basically i just studied. yeah when did you study <laughs> uh, so i would study 
like 7.30 right after meetings, I would go 7.30 to 10 and then drive home. At like, Jeez. Get home at like 11. Or like maybe, yeah, I'd probably study for like three and a half hours after meetings and then and then in between school times. I mean, honestly, I, right now, I don't know how I did it. <laughs> yeah, like just listening to it now, I'm it's just insane. Like I, once I start, but I feel like I'm going to have to learn. Oh, I'm sure you're going to get even better. Yeah. <laughs> when that... But, um, honestly i have no idea like it was school and and sport and yeah. social was like in the locker room hanging right with the guys like and that was about it for me yeah so what what led you to being a first responder after your undergrad yeah so um basically i applied to ubc meds uh, my first time i'm going into my final year at sfu okay so that was the year i did my honors thesis um and so yeah i actually applied and and um I didn't even get an interview. So okay. that was pretty like <laughs> tough yeah. for me. Especially because, like, if your plan was like grade 11. Yes. Yeah. yeah, especially like, um, you know, more of this type A yeah. you know, plan, 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 sacrifice, sacrifice, like type of person. And uh, I literally felt like I just wasted my entire college experience. Like it yeah. was a pretty low point for me um, because I put all like a lot of my eggs in that basket. Mm-hmm. I didn't even look, consider other programs at that point. It was like, I'm going into med. Um, and so, yeah, I, uh, I, I applied and didn't even get an interview. Uh, there's a couple of things that I, I think I did wrong. Like I wrote my application too quick. I, I thought that just because I had football, like they would just be like, Oh, come on. Yeah. You know, like, I think I was a little too confident. Yeah. Um, and so it, it was a huge gut check for me in my life. Like went through like, you know, um, definitely like a pretty tough time psychologically doing that honors project, but basically I needed to figure out what I was going to do next. And so I remember actually during that semester, um, my, my cousin, who's, um, he's in healthcare, he was actually suggesting me that instead of like doing another research job for that kind of year off when yeah. I reapply or whatever, um, that I should get my uh, emergency medical responder certificate through the justice Institute, or there's, there's a couple other you know, places that you can get it through. Um, and that I could actually like get a job and work as a, work as a paramedic with BC ambulance. Cool. That. And I just thought it was super cool to do. And, uh, that's basically what I did after I, I finished. Right. Yeah. Um, interestingly you say that you kind of felt like your entire, you, you missed yeah. out so much on yeah. your, uh, on your, like on your undergrad. Like it was, it was terrible. Like, do you mean, like, what do you mean in terms of like, just because like all that hard work didn't pay off or, yeah. or would you've done, you know, something different during your undergrad? Yeah. Like a lot of things, like our last two years at SFU, um, weren't good. Okay. Like people, I don't know how, how much people can follow the SFU football team. Yeah. <laughs> in my last two seasons, we actually didn't win a single game. Yeah. Um, so that was like super demoralizing for me. Um, and so I just felt like, should I have played those two years? Right. Like I kind of knew going into my fourth year that we weren't going to be good. And, yeah. I, and I was thinking like, is this a waste of time? Should I just go all into like some like research yeah. and work, just kind of end that chapter of my life. And I, but for me, I just felt like I needed to finish. Like I right. needed to finish something that I started, something I believe in Love that. myself. Um, that like, you know what, even how bad it was, like we literally lost every single game in my third year and we lost every single game in my fourth year. So I was like, no matter how bad it is, I'm going to complete this task. Right. Um, and so it was kind of almost on principle where I was just like, I got to finish this up, but yeah, yeah, it was, uh, uh as part of the SFU student community, yeah. we all knew that yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you, know, didn't, yeah, you didn't, you know, didn't like, even the laughing stock of like the entire, like athletics department, right. like why these guys gave me so much, like this, our budget budgets a lot. Yeah. Um, you know, more because we have people exactly people yeah say the least for sure um so can, can you explain about the process on how do you become a paramedic in bc like what courses yeah. and, and what do you need to take yeah so there's basically four different levels of paramedics that um bc ambulance hires there's the emergency medical responder which is kind of your first level which is the one that i have then there's the primary care paramedic pcp um and then there's the advanced care paramedic which is a higher level and then finally there's critical care paramedics um, and so they, all of those different levels have different uh, licenses and different abilities and interventions that they, they can do. And there's a primary care paramedic course, and that's going to be about eight months full time, like nine to five, right. five days a week. And then the advanced care course is two years after the PCP course. Okay. And then critical care, I think you have to get hand selected and it's like another like two to three years. Right. Of training after that. Okay. Uh, and this is a commonly searched term, but what, what is the difference yeah. between an EMT and a paramedic? Yeah. So that's like that. That's the, where it's funny. Like, would you consider me a paramedic? Yeah. Well, my badge says 
paramedic. I'm also a paramedic. <laughs> of course. Um, because it's in the in the state, I think BCM, like we don't have EMTs per se. Like I'm considered a paramedic. Yeah. But in the states, an EMT course is like similar amount of hours as the EMR course that I took, and their PCP course is similar. Uh, amount of hours as the our primary care paramedic course so kind of the difference between emt and pcp what i actually googled this a little bit too because i was curious but apparently emt is you can't like um basically poke through skin so you can inject like a needle okay you can't start an iv but you can do cpr you can do um full set of vitals you can do glucose like a blood glucose check you can do um ventilation there's quite a few things like uh, glucose you can administer some medications and things like that but you can't like intervene through right uh iv or um yeah like i am like different medications yeah. that involve that so for the record before we go into the next question i did give andrew the ability to you know pick and choose which ones to to keep or remove um so the next one is can you tell us your 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 most memorable story as a paramedic since i haven't worked uh like i've, I've been working for bc Ambulance for over a year now i got officially hired uh last may um and so when you an interesting thing is when people ask paramedics that question you know the longer you've worked the more things you've seen right so it's actually like quite a disturbing question sometimes I people ask bet yeah um and you know i feel like if i've if i had more traumatizing calls you know well i i've you know worked for years so i feel like i haven't had you know as many of the bigger calls right as, or that that kind of that attrition aspect um what i'm basically trying to say that is sometimes it's not the best question to ask a paramedic okay and as soon as you ask that question all those memories of that worst call that they've had is now fluctuated through their brain um and it's actually like a pretty if you will like triggering thing for for someone if you ask that so just word of con, con like uh yeah word of caution yeah pro tip psa don't always ask that question it's a very typical question to ask that being said the place that i work is is off like a, a highway so we have some traumas uh we've had some overdoses for sure um and the actually but i would say the bigger calls that i've had is when i've um done some ride-alongs in the city so again um i actually worked on a check day so a check mm -hmm. day is when um Basically, when income assistance checks uh, come out, there's a highly higher likelihood of overdoses and a lot more more things like that, um, unfortunately. Uh, and so I was doing actually a ride along in uh, Vancouver, and we actually had a call, um, yeah, in the downtown east side. Um, and yeah, that, that, that call was pretty big. Like we had a, 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 a patient, older guy, and um, yeah, again, over like overdose story, or overdose call and uh it's just a lot of stuff that we had to do a lot right. of interventions um and we actually had to go like right from from that area straight to the hospital into the emerge person had to get fully intubated like right into the trauma yeah. bay i think we had like about like six or seven nurses uh, i was helping out with another paramedic um kind of like the guy was like seizing as well there's a lot of things going on um but uh yeah that was i think that was definitely a tough call big call because the thing is like you know, every every single overdose, that's a person behind that. Right. And, and there's different things that has happened in that individual's life yeah. um, that we don't see at all. Uh, right. There's intergenerational trauma, you know, a lot of things that we have no idea. About. Right. So I think it's just for me as a paramedic as well is, is just thinking about like we see this. Oh, this is an overdose, but there's a person behind yeah. that. Um, and so I think that's definitely what made it made it tough for me. Right. I also have I have. Um, someone related to my family family who who has struggled with uh drug use and uh, he's now passed away yeah. so it, it was again something that kind of reminded right. me of, of him and um again probably why i'm wanting to go into health right to help some of those those, those types of for things. sure well i i appreciate you you mm -hmm. you telling that story yeah. and um could you go into like how yeah. you kind of cope with you know dealing with that type of accident that, that yeah. can be traumatizing yeah like how did you deal with it afterwards for sure um you know i think initially one of the big things is actually just like talking out with your partner after hmm. and it's but it's not even this like very serious like counseling thing that you right. think it's literally like oh that was a really like busy call mm -hmm. and you i don't know it's just like the act of having a conversation with your partner after is like basically the, the initial step for me that yeah. like helps me process through that like i don't think i was like really traumatized by yeah. it or like things like that um but 
I think having that, those initial conversations and having steps that, you know, when things that really hit you come, that you can kind of follow that, that routine or that those steps that you have can kind of get you through that. So for me, it'd be like talking to my partner right after and kind of just debriefing on that initially. And then exercise is actually a really big thing for me to reset. Mm-hmm. Like we had even, <clears throat> we had a, a patient pass away um, where I was working and we're doing CPR on her and things like that. And, and, you know, just, yeah, you just think of it as a, as a, as a person and, right. and uh, you know, it's an end of life and things like that. So, yeah. Um, yeah, like for me, it was just exercising, kind of reset the minds. Uh, and then, yeah, like reaching out to family and, and things like that. So I think for me, yeah, that's kind of my process is, is talking it out. Talking You're right. Almost, yeah. yeah, no, I, I think the talking part is is really underrated and, and not even this scenario, but just dealing with, you know, uh, personal issues at yeah. home, or, or you know, regardless of the setting, yeah. um, just talking to people yeah. um, in any capacity is, is definitely a great first step. So when you first found out that you didn't get into med school for the first time, um, I just kind of want to know what your mindset was like, and what led you to wanting to get your bachelor's of science in nursing? And did you ever consider just going down the nursing route uh, completely? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so yeah, my, uh, my mom actually was a nurse. Um, and why I actually wanted to pursue that is, as, as I talked about earlier, like I, I had that plan of, of going into medicine. Right. Uh, grade 11. <clears throat> but I think we adapt and we, we, we change our, our kind of plan as the process happens. Mm-hmm. And so, as as I was saying earlier, um, I initially applied to UBC and I right in my final year of SFU, and I and I got rejected. It didn't even work out. Um, so I didn't even get an interview. I was again distraught. Felt like a lot of things weren't working out. So that's kind of when I started pursuing the the emergency uh, EMS stuff, emergency medical service, paramedic stuff, uh, things like that. And so I that was my second time that I applied. Then during during that time, and actually. That time I got an interview, but I didn't get accepted. Hmm. And so during that process, though, I kind of reflected on what happened the first time I applied. So the first time I applied, I didn't have any um, other idea. Like I was like, okay, I'm going into medicine. Right. Whereas the second time I was like, you know what, let's be smart about this. And let's let's think about some other things that maybe you haven't always thought about. Um, and so that's actually why I was thinking of like, I looked in some other healthcare fields. I looked in pharmacy, nursing, um, or some other, I think it was more, yeah, mostly pharmacy and nursing, and and then also was thinking maybe some more paramedic stuff. Um, and I ultimately decided on nursing because I just felt like, for me, there was that again that that patient centered care aspect of it. Like nursing, you're with the patient consistently. Um, you still you know do a lot of really amazing things like working in like anyways. I was thinking of like working in emerge and and things like that. So I just felt like nursing would be a really good fit. There's tons of opportunities to work in so many different areas and there was tons of opportunities to get like um yeah to go into leadership or or even like practice autonomously through like the nurse practitioner program. Um and I looked at UBC's program and it was actually a accelerated program. It's five semesters. Um and I thought, you know, this could be a really good idea if again maybe medicine's not going to work out that I can get my nursing degree within five semesters, get a really stable job. Right. Um, and do again, kind of the, exactly the thing that I wanted to do, apply my science background, apply the healthcare knowledge that I know and work with people. Um, and so that's kind of the, the path that I, that I went on. Um, and, uh, yeah, it was, it, it was great. I, I really enjoyed it. Really good class, really good cohort, really genuine folks that I worked with. And, um, yeah. Yeah, great to hear. Um, I think that's a it's a great, you know, attitude and mindset to have that, you know, when you originally applied to med school, it didn't go right, that you realize what your values and your passions were, mm-hmm. and you knew what you want to do at the end of the day. And it may not have taken form, you know, in that plan A at that time to go through med school, but you still understood that there were other routes, and other careers that you could do that you can still apply those skills to still have those same values and passions in, in the work that you do yeah. uh, down the road. So that's Really good point. So what were the general requirements to get into med school? Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, it definitely depends on what school you're applying for. Uh, if we want to talk about UBC, uh, two English courses um, for prereqs, uh, 90 units of coursework, the MCAT, and I think that's about it, yeah. Okay, were there any unique requirements for UBC specifically? No. So like some schools have like, this thing called the Casper, which is a like online 
almost interview type thing that it's like the, it's a screening program, almost, right? But it, it gives you there's some like ethical scenarios you have to mm-hmm. respond to it. Uh, some schools have that, UBC didn't. Uh, I think the unique thing that though was when I first was considering med, um, UBC had a lot of prereqs, so they had yeah. to, you had to do like two years or yeah, a year of biology. Uh, I think like four chemistry courses, a bunch of different things. And right. actually halfway through my degree, they threw those out the window hmm. and said you had to take English, <laughs> which was actually <laughs> a little frustrating because again, me wanting to plan, you know, some of those pre courses are really hard. Yeah, like uh, O-Chem? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like organic, surprisingly, organic chemistry was one of my better classes. Oh. But yeah, like there's some courses that were pre-reqs yeah. um, that, you know, I didn't do as well in. Right. Uh, and, you know, in retrospect, like, again, you, you're going to learn a lot of material and it's important to have. So I'm yeah. happy that I did all the prereqs. But, you know, in terms of if you want your grades higher. What is the average minimum required GPA um, to get in? Yeah. Um, so, again, if we're talking UBC specific, yeah. uh, it's, I think, about 70%. This is like the minimum yeah. uh, to apply 70% or I think a 3.0 on a 433 or something like that. Right. Um if you look at UBC statistics, however, um, it kind of fluctuates. The actually the average GPA that they post that's adjusted. So the interesting thing with UBC is they take your worst thirty units out. Yeah. So your worst thirty units of your degree get thrown out the window, um, and so they call that the adjusted GPA. And so the average adjusted GPA of accepted medical students was eighty eight percent last year. Okay. Which is pretty high. Yeah. You look at that, you're like, wow, that means I need to, if you're an SFU student, yeah. that's my bias. you need to get somewhere between a three, six, seven and like, uh, actually, well, you need to get above an A average because an A gets converted to an 87%. Yeah. You can be at like a 4.1. You're like, no way. Yeah. Um, however, there's hope because that was definitely not my GPA. Yeah. I was within that three, six, seven to 4.0 range. Right. Um, and so you can actually also look at the different percentages. So um, I think about 50% of the students lined up in the 85% to 90% average. Okay. And then about 20% of students lined up in the 85 to 80 average. And then actually there was like three medical students who got in who were in like the 70 to 75% average. So again, that, that being said, like apply. Right. And it's so important to have those like, again, for me, my plan was I'm not this, you know, academic guru. Right. You know, I did well, um, but football took a lot of time and I focus a lot on my like research stuff and yeah. extracurriculars. And so, you're, they, they very much consider holistic application. And so, um, good to hear. Yeah. Like for me, my play was that holistic extracurricular aspect. That was like where I scored the highest. My grade right. was good. But again, it wasn't this like, you know, 4.0 guy. Right. Um, and I think that shouldn't deter, you know, some of the absolutely. people listening to this. You know, if, if I know some people like may have wanted to do med and mm. they're thinking, oh, I don't have that 4.0, I don't have that perfect GPA, kind of just goes as a testament that you don't need that, exactly. but you should have, you know, a good holistic yeah. experience, um, you know, whether through volunteering, mm. um, the work so as you said you could have you know be in that 75 to 80 percent range Absolutely. and you may have never thought about med school but it, it is there are there are people that do get in yeah and like you have a wealth of experience um and, and it maybe take you a little longer but right like that's the goal yeah Go did you need reference letters yes gotcha um, so the reference letters for ubc come into play after you get an interview okay okay so there's three different references that you need um there's an academic reference letter, there's a service orientated reference letter, and there's a professional orientated reference letter. Um, and so I think the biggest one should be thinking about when you're doing your undergrad is your academic one. And that would either be a professor that you take a class with, yeah, or um, in a better case scenario, if you could maybe do some research or, or even volunteer at a lab and that you kind of you're in to get that academic reference. Yeah. Right on. Um, can you speak to like the type of people that you chose for each one of your references? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, <clears throat> so for the ac- so again, academic one is is focused on a professor. I think right. it has to be a professor or someone who's taught you. Yeah. Uh, so for that one, I I did some research in my fourth year. I was fortunate to get involved with uh, a directed studies project, and then that kind of opened up a bunch of doors for me to like be a research assistant. Yeah. Thing, well, on a volunteer basis, so pretty much. Uh, at a lab. So I asked that that professor. And funny thing with that, though, is like one of the biggest questions is people are, at least I remember when I was going through the whole process was like, how do I get an academic reference? And right. How do I get involved in a lab? The biggest thing is email. email, email, email. <laughs> uh, and and what, how, however, 
you know, brutal the job may seem, do it. So I started off in a biology lab where I just cleaned instruments. Like I clean, I did the dishes for a biology lab. Yeah. And that was my first reason. <laughs> and I was like, wow, this is exactly what I did not want to do. Right. Um, but then that led me to, you know, gain some confidence and then reach out to some other professors and, and then get into their labs. So, mm -hmm. um, that was basically my, my play. And, and again, right. just go out there, just do it. Right. Uh, when you were washing... Uh, yep, <laughs> those dishes, dishes. um and pipettes i could use better words okay <laughs> okay but um dishes. did that experience help you network to other um professors to to, to do research for them well honestly what it made me think is because I, I feel like sometimes when you're when you're not and you're thinking oh i want to do some research stuff like you think of these people who are like these amazing people, right sorry <laughs> uh amazing like gpa yeah super smart and so i actually we, you know, worked in that lab and I was talking to some of the undergrads who were actually doing research positions like USRA, yeah. um, honors thesis, and they seemed like really normal people. Cool. And I was like, <clears throat> this person can do it. I feel like I can. Yeah. Uh, and so I kind of just that, that when I say confidence, that's kind of what yeah. made me think like, yeah, I, I could totally do some more things. Be cool. More independent, get, get my own projects. Great. Yeah. Um, so how did you prepare for the MCAT? Mm -hmm. Um, studied a lot. I honestly would say MCAT's one of the harder, hardest, harder, th hardest things I've done. Okay. Um, for me, it was, <clears throat> yeah, like two months of just straight studying in summers. I think that was like the big issue. Is like well, the big reason what made it so difficult was it, it was in the summer. Yeah. Every day, uh, right. at least for me, that's kind of how I did it. Like, did you go seven days? I would go like five days a week. Okay. Probably six hours per day um and i studied with a buddy that was like okay. the best thing that i did interesting um because it a provided a little bit of competition but it also provided like peer support yeah so like internally subconsciously you're like this is my competitor Anyways, yeah I'm <laughs> no that's fine that. no that's, that's uh, what you like need a so competitive spirit yeah but then also though it was like and the, but then we were both like you know reaching out like oh how are you preparing for this what right you good for that and so it basically kept us accountable um, yeah so i think that was like the best thing that i did and again yeah pro tip for mcat is like get your content done kind of early on but then do a bunch of questions 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 yeah. active learning did you do a lot of practice exams yeah so i actually did um seven practice full length exams before yeah. i actually wrote the exam and i did a little bit of a weirder way like i did i think four to five weeks before the actual MCAT, I did two MCAT full lengths per day. Wow. Which I per day. Or sorry. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Uh, per week. Okay. Yeah. So I did two two MCATs per week. Okay. Um yeah, I don't know if that's like the best model. Hmm. Uh, it's because I felt really crammed because I okay. I studied content too much and I wasn't getting my questions done. Right. And so that's actually when the guy that I was studying with, he's like, dude, you need to do more full lengths. Um, hmm. And so he encouraged me to like to start doing two full lengths a week. And, right. Uh, I think that played a lot of dividends because it gained my confidence. Yeah. Um, and then when I was like writing the exam, I, I felt like well, I've done this like yeah. times. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. In, in such a short amount of time too, yeah. like you said, you know, four to five weeks out, yeah. doing seven in total. Um, it's a lot. Yeah. And and, yeah, and for our cool. audience, like how long is each one? Yes. Each practice um, exam. So the the old the mcat is about eight hours yeah uh it's six and a half or seven of, of clicking buttons on the yeah. screen you have some breaks so you about have like an hour hour break in the total time um so yeah it's it's grueling um with covid i think they shortened it to like five hmm. but anyways right so. um what is a good mcat score to have to be competitive when applying to med schools mm -hmm. besides having that minimum score of 124 in each section yeah so Again, it's all school dependent. Um, like you were saying, 124 is the minimum for UBC. Yeah. Uh, some schools don't have those minimum cutoffs. Okay. There's different rules if you're applying to an out-of-province school. So say I was applying to University of Alberta, I, need, I would need to get, I think, at least, if I'm out-of-province, 128 on each section. Okay. Whereas if I was an in-province Alberta student, I would only need to get 124 minimum on right. each section. Okay. So, excuse me. <laughs> that being said, um, there's four different sections in the MCAT. And so they summate those scores to a total of, I think the lowest possible is like 490 or 480 something. And the maximum is like 523. Yeah. So 
500 though is the 50th percentile median. Um, and so UBC's average MCAT score of accepted, again, applicants is 515. And so when you look that up, that's like 93rd percentile. Hmm. Like, wow. That's yeah. Crazy. And again, that wasn't my story. I was, I was, yeah, like I wasn't a 515 person. I think yeah. I'm like, or, or yeah, like 80, third percentile i don't know something right it was like early 80s and again i was freaking out you know what your score uh aggregate score was yeah yeah yeah, 510 okay but i've heard people so yeah so 510 like it's not bad it's okay yeah it's not amazing it's like 83rd percentile you're like oh i wish i could get that right you know because you would think like oh if i get the average competitive score then i'm bound to get in Mm -hmm. um but i was 510 and i know also people who have like 506 which is like 70th percentile yeah and they got in this year right so like there's no set score that you need to get and that's like the whole crazy thing I, at least at ubc again very holistic right do your best type of thing accomplish it but yeah five, i would say like a 512 would be a great score cool um, which would be like 80th great or high 80s yeah. yeah and uh what, what was the application or the interview process like as much as detail as you can give because yeah. i know you can't give all the yes. minute details <laughs> yeah for sure um but no the stuff that's public so the application uh, is, yeah, different phases. So the, well, I think one of the big ones was first you have to do like what what's some research experience that you've had. So you right. list out all the poster presentations, um, like the articles that you've published. Um, yeah, like that's pretty crazy. But, yeah. <laughs> um, oral presentations that you've done. So that's yeah. one section. Another section is you put all your grades. So that's where they get the aggregate uh, GPA score. And then the big section, though, is your um, non academic diversity of experience mm-hmm. leadership section. So that one actually has uh, 24, 25, I believe, different activities that you can put in. And so you want to theoretically be filling that thing all up so i think there's like three sections on leadership that you can fill in three sections on um working with others five on uh i don't know caring for other people like right different sections and there's 12 like diversity of experience so that's another section and then there's also your employment history um and those are kind of the big ones uh, okay yeah. and then they create a score based on that's great that. Yeah. So in hindsight, is there anything you wish you had known or had done differently starting in your undergrad, um, knowing that you want to become a doctor minus taking, you know, those chemistry courses that you didn't need to take down the road? Uh, yeah, I still like them. Ah, uh, man, that's a good question. Cause I, I feel like I'm a type of person who, you know, I think everything happens for a reason. And yeah. like, looking back hindsight, I'm like, I don't know if I've changed anything. Like, I'm so happy that like, it took me a little while to get in that it didn't go perfectly because I've like learned so much about myself. Right. Actually. All of a sudden did EMS. Then I did like nursing for a little bit. Yeah. I also worked um, as an outreach worker in the, in the, in the downtown East side during, during my time off. And again, that built such like a wealth of perspective right. and experience that like now going forward um, would be great. That being said, um, I think I wish I was a little less intense. Yeah. Um, as you guys probably can say, maybe I'm probably a little more, you know, focused type yeah. of person. Um, and so I would let really the emotions of like not doing well. Yeah. Me. Um, and I think that that's so common with like undergrads, right? Because your entire identity is like this number on a piece exactly. of paper. And if you don't get, you know, certain grade, you're a failure. Yeah. And I definitely felt that when the first time I applied that literally the four years that I did, um, uh, you know, we're worthless because I didn't get an interview right off the bat. And right. Don't have that mindset though. Like be rolling with the punches, you know, try different things out. Um, so I think that's kind of my word of advice. It's so hard to do yeah, because we're such creatures of, you know, at least like, you know, trying to push and, and exactly. We can, but I think just, you know, relaxing and calming and enjoying yeah. enjoying life a little more because it was, it was so hectic and uh, definitely. Yeah. Great advice. Yeah. Um, so what are you most excited for as you begin the med program at UBC? Yeah. Um, I think meeting a lot of people, meeting like yeah. different people. I'm, I'm really excited for that. With COVID, it really complicates things. Um, but this is funny. Um, I know also, Craig, from we used to be in a jazz band. Yes. Together yes. In high school, <laughs> uh, which was honestly like, 
football was really good. I I love jazz band though. Like yeah. it's so high up. It's completely like, different. Like it, it could in terms of experience. Yeah. Of like how exciting. <laughs> that, the high school, you know, experience. It was it was amazing. Yeah. So it was funny. I um I when I reached out or when when I got accepted, I actually reached out to my band teacher because he was such an influence on me. Yeah. And he actually reminded me, he's like, Oh yeah, you should consider joining the UBC. <laughs> that jazz band. Amazing. And I was like, what? Uh, so I looked it up and uh, I don't know if it's gonna happen this year with COVID. Yeah. All the things with that. But um I think it'd be kinda cool to rekindle my trumpet skills. That would be amazing. And, uh, join the join the that jazz band. But yeah, meeting other people though, I think is the biggest thing that I'm looking forward to. That's great. Yeah. Um any plans to Enter into, into UBC's flag football leagues. Oh, <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I don't know if there's a specific flag football like club, but I would. I feel like I would definitely be an asset. Uh, yeah. But I feel like there's a lot of pressure though. Yeah. Like, being, <laughs> you know, being like the person who's actually played college, like there's so much expectation on you, and you're like, oh, what if I like, <laughs> it's like a lose lose for me. Like, what if someone who like didn't play as much, like I get beat by them? Like, oh, yeah, so that's fair. That's fair. So sometimes you're like it's a smarter play to not be involved so you can oh, just have that little like right you feel really good about yourself and then like you're you're, you're, you're too good to play in those leagues then <laughs> yeah, so you, that's what i think but there's yeah probably not probably right um <laughs> any last words of wisdom for our audience who are you know considering med school um and potentially studying at ubc yeah um knowing that there's so many different stories like i'm i'm one story uh i know other people who've gone in like they're super smart to get in like after three years. I know other people who uh, they've been out of school for like eight years, 10 years, and then got in. I think honestly, like I hate doing all these cliches, but like pushing yourself and stretching yourself and doing like different things that you think are awesome. Right. Um, for me, it was like doing research. I actually thought it was really cool. Like I did the research just, you know, also because it was like helpful for med but like i was really interested in it and yeah really passionate about it. then i did the ems because i'm like well maybe like this is something that i'm interested in. so like pursuing different like random things that you are passionate about again hey it probably people are like, oh, don't like again, <laughs> no it's good though but said, but this is just proof yeah um that it works and yeah. that I, I like you know you did some research on stuff you you played football you thought yeah. that was good enough it wasn't yeah but then you went out um you know ventured into the nursing route then you ventured yeah. into um you know uh yeah, working work from, yeah exactly now. like there's so many different things that i kind of exposed about myself through, while i was trying to sort out you know the plan and right. it just provided so much richness and of, of life experience yeah um, and so yeah it's things that i'll take care of or uh, that will help me going forward so anyways yeah like rolling with it and and uh not beating yourself up yeah like having that positive mindset because i i know especially like under we can be so self-critical of ourselves right i definitely was um and you don't want to like you know hate who you are exactly you guys are talented and you bring so many things to the table yeah um and so yeah just keep doing it i feel pumped up right yeah. now it's like you just gave a speech <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> all right well um thank you so much for coming on to the show today uh, and I'm really excited to see to see your journey unravel because yeah. uh, this is really just the beginning yeah. uh, of the next several years yeah. going to med school. But yeah. I'm super proud of you, man, and uh, can't can't wait to see where you go. Yeah, I appreciate it, Craig. And just one side note: uh, next podcast, ask Craig how his high school pump up speech was. <laughs> Like next episode, you gotta ask. We don't. We don't talk about this. uh, That was one of the funniest, (laughs) most inspirational football speeches I ever heard of. I think that was my video. Okay, we go look at the Okay, uh, you know, insert here. Okay, (laughs) appreciate that. Thanks, man. (laughs) Oh man, which one? They were all bad. (laughs) 